what I'm going to show you now is trimming what we call a St. Louis style spare rib. There's chine bone and cartilage across the top of this slab of ribs and it makes the ribs cook uneven. So to, to allow them to cook evenly, we'll remove that chine and that cartilage. And we'll also remove this flap of skirt meat. And what we end up with is what is called a St. Louis spare rib. Now you can use all of this as trim for making sausage. And you can cook this piece whole, make what we call rib tips, usually a sports bar appetizer. But if you have a program where you can produce your own sausage, you can use this meat as part of the trim to make your sausage. So I'm gonna trim it right now for that. And again, I wanna leave all of this cartilage that's here behind, so I'm just following it with my knife. So what I've left behind is just the pieces of cartilage. And this, uh, you could make a stock or something with it if you wanted to use it for soup, but other than that, this you could throw away. And we peel the membrane off the back side. It allows more of the smoke to penetrate and get more flavor all the way through the room. Trimmed out and ready to go. So at this point, we have options to season these. If the rib is really lean, you might want to brine or inject it. A rib like this where you can see the fat within the muscle and you have nice uh, structure to the ribs probably doesn't need to be brined. We can just go straight to seasoning. So usually you can use a little mustard or oil or even vinegar to wet the surface of the meat and act as a binder for your rub. And anything that is a little acidic like a mustard or a vinegar will help open up the pores of the meat and, and allow that to occur quicker. The rub has uh, started to work into the surface of the meat these can go into the cooker. So you could give them 10 to 15 minutes and you'll notice that this will go from light and dry looking to darker and wet. So we should be able to go check on our pork ribs now and see if they are ready to go. When I'm looking for doneness, I check a couple of different things. First, I want to see the slab break over. And then I look at the bones and I look to see if the meat can move freely from the bone. Alright, so this is a rib short rib. You might also find chuck short ribs that are similar to this, but this cut of meat can take a lot of flavor on. You can use a bolder rub with more uh, power to it and the beef will hold up to it. Specifically with ribs, I really like to use earthy flavors that bring out the beefiness like coffee and chipotle. So for these ribs, they have silver skin all over the top that is not permeable to smoke and it doesn't cook away when cooking. So we are gonna remove all of the silver skin and any extraneous fat. All right, so now I'm also gonna score the back of this since there is still some connective tissue there that I wanna let the flavor to. All right, so those are essentially ready to season, but I'm gonna set them aside for a minute and we can talk a little bit about the flavors that go into the rubs. So I have two rubs here. One is what we uh, put on our pork ribs, and one is the coffee rub we put on the beef ribs. So we'll start with the coffee rub. So salt, garlic powder, and onion powder. And then this is cayenne on the top, and then the chili powder, cinnamon. A little coffee, and brown sugar. And we could use a little bit finer salt with this so that it isn't so in your face when you take a taste of it. So now we have our done beef ribs that we will be able to eat. So typically for short ribs, I'll use choice. You can use prime if you want. The nice thing about barbecue is because of the way that we're cooking them, long and slow over low temperatures, we have time to break everything down. So a, a choice cut actually works great for barbecue uh, for this type of a meat. Usually if I'm using prime with a short rib, I'm doing something grilled or raw where I'm just shaving it and using it in small portions.
So this is a, a Boston butt or a pork shoulder roast. This particular one is boneless, which is I believe what you have available here. So there's a couple of things that you'll pay attention to with boneless butts. Uh, and that is typically where these muscles come together, there's silver skin in here, but if this isn't attached to the bone, I can't remove the silver skin or I'll separate all the muscles. When you're done cooking this, you'll remove it after it's cooked. So the first thing I'm looking for when I start to trim this out is I look for any extraneous bone or cartilage. You can feel it with your hands, so you just kind of feel around and find it and then remove it. So after I've removed all the little bone shards, I come in after silver skin and extra fat and veins. Because again, the, that extra fat on the outside isn't uh, going to help moisturize the meat. It rolls off when it cooks. So I want to maximize the surface where I can get rub. And lastly, I'm going to come in here in this triangle and take out a gland that's in there. So it's not going to hurt the cooking process, but it will get firm and bitter. So I remove it. So a large cut like this is great to brine or inject. You'll get a similar effect, but I've, I tend to like injection a little better because I can control how much liquid makes it into the meat. So I usually inject into a piece of meat this size about 200 mils. And I'll take the needle and move it around inside the muscle so that there's room for the liquid to move. And I work my way through all the muscles because there's probably eight or 10 different muscle groups inside here. All right, so that just needs to rest for a little while till the rub gets soft like it did on the ribs, and then it can go to the cooker. Uh, because it's such a large cut of meat though, you can rest this overnight in the fridge and allow the rub to penetrate more. So the process on this is a little longer than the ribs. Typically, we're going five to six hours before we wrap, and there's uh, two ways that you can choose to cook the pork shoulder. You can cook it for slicing or for pulling. Uh, if you're cooking to slice, you're going to take it to a slightly lower temperature so that it still holds together just enough to allow the slices to hold. Pulling, we take it on up to 205 so that all of the collagen and connective tissue is broken apart and then it pulls nice and easily. So this is what we call a whole brisket or a packer brisket. It has both muscles on it. It has the flat and then it has the point up here. And so in Kansas City style briskets, we take that point and turn it into burn ends like we just did. The typically what we're using to cook with, an Angus product for brisket, it, it ends up being a little more tender and has a lot of flavor. So this is a certified Angus beef which is one of the brands of Angus available and it's a choice. So the first thing I'm gonna do is remove this big vein of fat right here. And then there's a line of cartilage right there that I'm gonna see that. And it comes all the way around. And if you feel this area, it's very hard. So we typically are just gonna remove behind that. As you're removing this top layer, you'll see where the two muscles come together. All right, so once we have this exposed, now I can separate the point and the flat. I'm just following the seam of the two muscles. I'm letting the knife do the work. I'm not putting any pressure on it at all. So that's what we make our burn ends out of. And there's so much intermuscular fat that they stay nice and moist and juicy. And because we've separated it from here, we get twice as much surface area for rub and smoke. And then to finish trimming our flat, I'm just gonna remove this thicker vein of fat right here. So typically, depending on the type of cooker you have, if you are cooking in a pit that heats from the bottom up, you'll put the fat cap down, which should protect the meat and also render the fat 
onto the diffuser plate and create more flavor. If you're cooking top down, uh, you could flip it over for the same reason. In general, you don't have to inject a brisket, but if you want, if you're worried about moisture content because it looks very lean, or if it's small and thin, you can inject it to help ensure you get enough moisture content.